homelessness among women in Tucson. It is very frightening on the street. Plus Pima Community College after probation. They also seem to go looking forward. And more, this is Metro Week. Hi, I'm Vanessa Barchfield, in for Andrea Kelly. Thanks for joining us. This week, we visit a new facility where homeless women in Tucson can spend their nights and days, then a check-in with Pima Community College, a conversation with a longtime fixture of journalism in Tucson, and a look at climate change on Native American lands. All that after a look at the week's top stories from the Arizona Public Media Newsroom. Mount Lemon Highway and Reddington Road are open to the public after a wildfire forced their closure nearly two weeks ago. The borough fire burned more than 27,000 acres and prompted the community of Summer Haven to be evacuated. A final update from the team battling the fire came Thursday night and shows the fire is 95% contained. Crews stopped the fire before any buildings were damaged. The Pima County Board of Supervisors has voted to follow the goals set forth by the Paris Climate Accord. The county is now working to spell out specific practices it will take to lower greenhouse gas emissions. President John Donald Trump withdrew the U.S. from the anti-climate change agreement last month. Southern Arizona's summer rains have arrived. National Weather Service data show Tucson received its first measurable rain in two months on Monday, and weekly totals have exceeded an inch. The monsoon also brought strong dust storms to portions of Pima, Cochise, and Pinal counties, mostly in areas devoid of vegetation. And an education initiative from the mayor's office will continue for the next three years thanks to grant funding. The Community Schools Initiative has boosted graduation rates at eight area high schools and increased the number of students applying for federal aid for college over the past two years. For more on all of the week's news, visit our website, news.azpm.org. Sister Jose Women's Center has long served Tucson's homeless women. About two months ago, the center opened a new facility. We drop by for a visit to see where women with nowhere else to go can spend the hottest hours of the day. You're doing okay today? Yeah. That's what I'm checking more than anything. I am Jean Fedigan, and I am the executive director for Sister Jose Women's Center. We began that first winter in a little church on 10th and 19th in Assembly of God. That uh, third year, we were, a donor came forward and just became a real angel. He helped us lease a small house at 18 West 18th. We were there about four years. And during that period of time, um, we began to see our services grow. Two and a half years ago, we just recognized we were way outside of the limits that we needed to provide services. And we began a search for a building and, and ran into some problems um, because of neighborhood concern or zoning or whatever it was where we would need to um, make some changes. And we came upon this property and we finished it this past spring and moved in here on April 28th. My name is Kim Carlson and I am a guest and I'm also an employee here at the shelter. I've been homeless for, say, a little over a year, and um, I resigned from my employment um, for ethical reasons, and um, that put me in the position of being homeless. Never have I been homeless in my life, so it's a whole new experience for me. Um, I, um, I didn't know where to go. I, I didn't have any resources. Women find us by word of mouth, word on the street, I ran into a couple of women and they told me about the shelter. We serve 80 women during our day program. It's kind of an all-in-one, the services that I get here myself. Um, I can do my laundry, I can eat, um, I have a place to relax, a safe place to relax, and a place to sleep. So, you know, you have access to the internet, you have access to clothes. We do a shop. Uh, so that women can come and get a couple of, uh, homeless women, 
can come and get a couple of items of clothing, try to help them if they have an interview. Um, and then we do the night program, which brings them out of the vulnerability on the street, but to be here overnight. And I can have 35 women here, and I do. Circumstances that each woman goes through that lands them in a place of being homeless has a tremendous stress effect on the body. And so just eliminating one piece of that by having a safe place where you can read, watch TV, you know, that helps to kind of keep you grounded a little bit, a little sense of normalcy. Women are social and we like community and we like to meet one another and we want to tell our stories and so they come for services. Then we do classes that will allow them um, to begin that interaction that really helps them and they form their support systems. I find myself very much part of a community, a community of women in a similar situation that I'm in. And in that, I find strength and comfort. It is very frightening on the street. If you're alone and you sit down in the park or you fall asleep or you live in a stairwell or a tunnel or whatever it is, it's very difficult um, to find safety. And there's a lot of violence, um, trafficking, um, and things that occur on the street that you and I would not think about. And so to provide a safe environment where they can just feel human, they can have someone treat them with compassion and dignity, that raises their awareness of who they are and gives them the courage that they need to begin to find their own resources. I can't tell you how important it is to look them in the eye and say good morning by name and ask how we can help and to treat them with dignity. The women will tell you that that's one of the best things that we do. We are pretty much run by a cadre of volunteers from across the community. It's an extraordinary um, blessing. We are privately funded, so any donations um, are very welcome and really needed as we try to grow program and move forward with our with our resources here. Some of my hopes for the future, um, to bring more awareness to the shelter. Um, um, I think it's, it's, it's a wonderful stepping stone to get to another place in your life. My goal is that we don't have homeless people. That may never be, but we need to find something within our hearts to recognize that these people are simply you and I, and they need the support and the help to move forward in their lives. It's been a turbulent few years at Pima Community College. The school was on probation and then under sanction from its accreditor. I met with Vice Chancellor for External Affairs, Lisa Broski, to talk about the impact that the removal of all sanctions, which happened earlier this year, has had on morale. One point of clarity is that the college never lost its accreditation, but the way we like to refer to it is the warning light was on the dashboard and now it's off. And yeah, it's tremendous, um, tremendous on morale and tremendous on the work we're doing. We spent so many years looking backward, trying to figure out what we did wrong and how to fix it. Now everything, all systems are go looking forward. And so we have a very aggressive agenda on where the college needs to be in the future and uh, we're, we're focused on that new agenda. And are there still some safeguards in place to make sure that Pima doesn't find itself in that situation again? Absolutely. So there's a, so accreditation is a continuous improvement process, and so it's something that we always pay attention to. And um, so while we were on the um, probation and then the notice status, now we're on something on our normal standard pathway of accreditation. Um, we will have another site visit coming up in several months. We don't have a date yet, um, but that keeps us constantly focused on what we need to do on meeting and when we can exceeding the requirements. So yeah, you never let your foot off that gas. It's it's important to keep keep your eye on it, and keep working all the time and uh, we certainly are dedicated to that. Chancellor Lee Lambert has said on a number of occasions that he wants to turn Pima Community College into one of the preeminent community right. colleges in the country. How much progress are you making in that direction um, and sort of what are the, the, the challenges that you, that you see still um, facing the college? 
So we want to be a premier institution that's measured by the service we pro provide to the communities, the quality of the workforce we're producing, and certainly the quality of the student who's graduating from our institution. And so we're doing a number of things to address that. Uh, one is that we've really strengthened our working relationship with our employers. Um, it's a whole new world in workforce and the community college needs to adapt to that. And, I, and, um, and then the other thing we're doing is really focusing on our students. We are working on something that we're calling guided pathways. And the idea is um, kind of like in law school, or med law school or medical school, students have that prescribed pathway from beginning to end. Well, that's what we're going to do for our students. And they'll still have opportunities for choices, but the idea is to show them the finish line before they even start, to motivate them to finish the program. And so we're going to start rolling out our guided pathways um, next fall in 2018. And I think students are going to be really excited about that. And it's proven um, to work for both retention and student graduation rates. So we anticipate seeing even more students make it to graduation and make it to transfer to university. We're very excited about the progress we're making there. Last month, the governing board, of course, adopted a budget that's slightly smaller than last year's. Where are those cuts coming from? Like a lot of community colleges and a lot of public um, institutions, so most of our budget is in personnel because we're a service organization. So while we're looking at um, cuts in operating expenses, we're really holding the line on personnel. So currently, we have 100 positions that came open empty for various reasons, attrition reasons, um, that we are not planning to fill. And so we're being really careful in new hires. Every position is evaluated as to its need and its fit to the institution. And so that's, a really, that's one of the most important things that we're doing right now is really holding the line of personnel. But as we move forward, we're going to be looking at absolutely everything we do. Um, we want to get even leaner than we are now, and we know that we can get there. So a big part of our challenge is that um, you know, after the Great Recession, a community college enrollment across the country just exploded, and everybody had record enrollments, including Pima. Well, now we've stabilized, so the, the economy's gotten better, enrollments have settled back down to a normal roar, and we're still staffed up for that peak enrollment. So what we need to do is essentially right-size ourselves, and so we'll be working on that a little bit at a time, and it's the right thing to do. It's where we need to be. So will we be seeing any layoffs at Pima? Our goal is not to get to layoffs, so we think there's a lot of other things we can do before we would even consider such a thing. Um, but obviously we're going to be fiscally prudent and we're going to be good stewards of our resources and you know, we'll take what action we have to take, but we certainly want to avoid layoffs. We want to be good stewards of our resources and we're going to be mindful of everything that we have to do to be that good steward. Um, but we also recognize that we have wonderful personnel dedicated to students, great faculty, great student services, and we want we don't want to interrupt that, so we want, to, we want to keep that solid and strong, and so we're going to look at everything else we can do to avoid that. Earlier this year, the board was presented with three different budget scenarios. One of them included pretty large cuts over the next few years that would have resulted in the closure of a campus um, and the elimination of some programs. They, of course, didn't choose that okay. scenario, but is that an option that's still on the table going forward? Well, right now, no, because they've settled on what we referred to as option B, which was kind of the middle of the road. So it has aggressive cuts, um, but it wasn't um, the, the deep cuts that we saw in scenario three. Now, scenario three would have been a game changer. I mean, it's, it's a way to take the institution, completely turn it on its head and be where we need to be in a year or two. It's the kind of thing that you see businesses doing quite often. Um, but our board, I think, rightfully thought that um, taking that middle approach, um, aggressive but not as aggressive, was the right way to go and, um, and settle into our changes and, and move forward that way. And I think it's the right direction. I think we're all comfortable with that and it's working for the college. Do you expect that state funding will ever be restored to the college? Well, we certainly hope the state would support the institution, and if, if they don't support it with operating expenses, um, we have certain projects that we'd like to see move forward. We could double the size of our aviation program if we had proper funding to do that, and our, certainly our employers would support that. So there are opportunities for the state to support us in ways beyond operating expenses. But what we have to look at is that um, every time we faced one of those cuts, either tuition went up or we had to look at an increase in taxes. So the, the burden falls on somebody. And I think what we have to decide as a state and maybe as a community is where that burden needs to fall. Um, you know, our students are uh, often among the poorest in our community. So we really don't want to raise tuition. And so our options are looking at public funding. 
Um, we hope the state would take that into consideration. It would make a difference. Tom Beale has been a longtime fixture of journalism in Tucson. He retires this week after 43 years with the Arizona Daily Star. Tom came into our studios to look back at some of the highlights of his career. I wrote a column on the editorial page for 13 years. And while I wrote mostly about government and politics, I also wrote about my family, what I was thinking that day. Uh, if I were writing today with this great monsoon rain, I'd be writing about how wonderful rain is in the desert. Uh, and, it, and it gave me a connection to our readers that I hadn't had before then. And so that was probably, you know, my best writing chore. Uh, three columns a week for 13 years. Are there any stories that you've worked on um, over your career that still resonate with you today? Probably, and, and this would be the thing I'm proudest of, and it's not something I wrote. Uh, Carmen Duarte, who's a very talented reporter at the Arizona Daily Star, wrote a series about her family that basically traced the story of immigration in Arizona uh, called Mama Santos. And uh, I was her editor, and she spent six months researching that, another three months writing that. Um, she actually, uh, to relieve her of distractions, I set her up in my home, and she would write all day, and then she would sit and have a beer with my wife, and when I came home from work, we would sort of uh, figure out what she'd been writing. That series, which uh, became a book, um, was a, uh, uh, an award-winning series. Uh, but more importantly, it was just this wonderful, touching story about her love of her mother and her family. What will you miss most about working at the, at the Star? I think the camaraderie, uh, the excitement of being in a newsroom, and it's not always exciting, but uh, I've had many election nights there where everybody gets together and everybody's working toward one purpose, and we write almost the entire paper in a couple hours, and then we stick around and we wait till it comes off the press and we look at it and we say, wow, that was pretty damn good. And it's amazing what a team can accomplish in a short time in journalism, and it, it always makes you pretty proud. Are there any issues in the, the Tucson community that you'd like to see more reporting on? I think that uh, we need to recommit ourselves to covering uh, the role of government and politics. And we do a good job, we do a better job than anybody, but we used to have more people doing it. And as we all know, uh, newsrooms are shrinking across the country. Uh, I, would, uh, I would focus more on local government, and we do a lot of that. We do a lot of uh, watchdog journalism. Uh, but we need to be there day to day. We need to be there all the time. We need to be at the legislature and the city council and the courts uh, because otherwise people won't know what's going on. They'll only have the government telling them what they're doing. You mentioned, of course, shrinking newsrooms. Um, journalism has changed a lot, of course, over the last four decades. Can you point to some way in which it's more robust these days, um, and then conversely, um, a change that you think is detrimental? You know, when I first started, we were, we were typing away on typewriters. When I first started, I was a librarian. Uh, I had an English lit degree. I didn't have journalism training. I got a job as a librarian at the Star, and, and my task was to cut the paper into little bits and pieces and file it in manila envelopes so that we could do research on it. You know, reporters would come in and get the clip files and know what was written before. Um, seven people did that job. All seven of those jobs went away uh, when somebody developed a computer algorithm that allowed search engines on the web uh, overnight. Uh, there have been a lot of overnight changes as a result of the internet. Some good, some bad. Uh, I used to write on a typewriter. Um, I write much better on a computer. You know, the ability to revise things, to move a graph from one section of, of your story to another without having to rip paper in half and paste it, that seemed like a, an amazing uh, thing to me when it, when it first came about. Um, the tools that we have, have have made the job easier, more efficient, and I think better. Um, the people that we have working there now are a much more sophisticated bunch than when I first started working there. So when I first started working there, they were more of us. 
but it was it was a much less sophisticated brand of journalism and and I think the staff we have now is as good as it's ever been. You've done a lot of reporting over the years on science, on environmental stories, water. How did you end up from, you know, from the library, how did you end up on that beat? I kept getting assignments and I kept doing well at them and they kept like giving me new assignments. So um, when I left the library, I did the usual weather and obits, night cops, that kind of stuff, the sort of nuts and bolts of the newspaper. Um, then they sent me to Southern Arizona, where uh, I covered, you know, four counties and did everything. Brought me back and put me to work at City Hall, where I was the City Hall reporter, then the political reporter, and then went into management very briefly, because management doesn't agree with me. Uh, so I've had a lot of different jobs at the Star. I didn't really choose them. I just sort of, uh, you know, when the opportunity came up, uh, I was there. and. Uh, it's been nice to change subjects. You've been a professor at the U of A School of Journalism, mm -hmm. um, and you will continue in that role after well, you retire. What advice do you have for young journalists? Every semester when I get a new class, I ask the students you know, what, what their dream job is. And it used to really sort of irritate me when they'd all say, oh, I want to write about sports. I want to write about fashion. Um, I want to do this, I want to do that, none of it being daily newspaper journalism. Uh, and that used to bother me. It doesn't bother me anymore because the reality is there are a lot of jobs out there that are not strictly newspapers and newspaper jobs are hard to get. But there are always one or two in every class who you look at and say, yeah, they already know how to do this and they're going to get better and they are committed to it. Um, and, and so I just tell them, you know, whatever you want to do, just, just do it. Um, go out and do it and, and take an internship now and, and uh, make sure you have some experience before you apply for that job because those jobs are tough to get. All right. Well, Tom, thank you so much again for coming in and congratulations. Thank you. Drought, wildfire, and poor air quality. Those are just a few of the vulnerabilities that Native American tribes experience in terms of climate change. This week, California-based Fielding Graduate University hosted a panel of Native Americans and climate experts who are working with tribes to measure the impact of climate change and come up with ways to adapt to it. I sat down with two of the panelists in our studios and started off by asking about the most pressing issues. So for the Southwest, um, we recently, through our Native Nations Climate Adaptation Program, um, did an assessment over the last year and we're able to talk to uh, multiple tribes throughout Arizona, Nevada, California, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico. And, and through that assessment, I think it was it, what came out of it was was really identifying what climate change activities the tribes are already engaged with, but also what issues they are dealing with to actually get work done within the climate change realm. And so it's um, for that, most of it came out of is, is, is a few different things. Um, one was funding, um, of course, it's, it's something that um, everybody's gonna be able to tackle, especially for tribes. Um, tribes deal with a number of different issues from healthcare, education, law enforcement, um, um, basic you know, shelter, and basic standards of living. And so when they're looking at climate change, climate change is gonna affect all those different things. And so I think that's one of the issues, um, will be the largest issue moving forward for tribes is to find secure funding, uh, both from a federal standpoint, a state standpoint, and I think privately, is how can we look at foundations and be able to fund those activities. Um, secondly, I, I think with tribes, one of the major issues they're looking at with, with is, is partnerships, is collaborations. Um, partnerships will be key for them looking at um, universities, um, consulting agencies, um, it could be for-profit businesses as well. Uh, so it's something that tribes are going to be able to look at and identify who they're going to partner with and moving forward, because one of the thing, key things for them is getting the data necessary to do these climate change um, basic research for them. Um, you know, so I think those two things identified um, will be a huge factor in moving tribes forward in the future, but um, I think it's those two things. Though. What tribes are particularly vulnerable to climate change and in what ways? Um, there's a tribe actually in Alaska, um, Yupik, which is actually um, became one of the very first to vote for relocation because their reservation was um, going underwater. And so they voted as a, as a village to actually move the reservation. So I think it's one of those tribes where this is not a you know, long-term, we're gonna deal with it in 20, 30 years down the road issue. There are tribes right now, especially in Alaska and Louisiana, that are underwater. 
So it is a security issue for those tribes, I think, moving forward. Skylar, I want to bring you in. What would you say are the main barriers to adaptation um, on, the, on the reservations? I think one of the main barriers is funding. So finding the adequate source of support that tribes can get. Uh, a lot of tribes have been seeking out funding to do adaptation planning. Um, and there has been a lot of support there, but the actual implementation work has been another barrier. Um, within our assessment of tribal climate change activities in the Southwest, we identified um, some key main areas uh, where tribes are working on climate change. So getting the community involved, um, having uh, support from outside agencies, outside universities, partners um, to educate community members. Uh, funding was a key issue. So a lot of the funding comes for tribal climate change either comes from um, Bureau of Indian Affairs or Environmental Protection Agency. And so any changes in funding to those um, pots of those sources of money um, will affect tribal climate change adaptation. Uh, technical work uh, that tribes need assistance with, so getting the data and uh, finding ways to apply that data um, is also a key uh, factor in addressing adaptation. Chad, is climate change as much of a controversial issue on reservations as it is in the nation as a whole? I don't think it's much of a, of a controversy. I think it's more so as far as what is the, how do you rank order it as far as how are you going to tackle things on a reservation? So I think it's, uh, when I first got here though, um, I actually come from a law background. I don't come from an environmental background per se. Uh, but one of my very first conferences here, um, it was actually housed at Casino del Sol, which is in Tucson. Um, it was a, a Southwestern Ag Conference, and we dealt with some of the same questions. Um, you know, some of the things things come up as far as, you know, Native American people have been here, you know, centuries, and we've dealt with these issues, and we'll deal with them again. So it's not so much of a denial, it's, it's we'll get through it kind of thing. Um, but with tribes, I think it's, um, you know, something I always caution with, with tribal council is that we plan for a number of different things, whether it's the economy, education, healthcare. Uh, this is another component to all that. And so I think when it's, uh, we're looking at as far as, you know, with tribal nations, I think it's, it's, it is an issue, it'll always be an issue, uh, but I think it has to be, it's looked at as far as what are we gonna tackle first? You know, are we gonna tackle the economy? Are we gonna look at education? How are we gonna keep care of our kids and elders? And then moving down the list of, if we got enough funding, and, and I know we keep bringing up funding, but it's a major component to this. And it's something that tribes rely on, um, you know, for a lot of different things for the federal government. But it's something that, um, you know, we've also become, we're, we're sovereign nations, and we have our own economy base, but we do need assistance when it's coming when it's comes to this matter. How much um, awareness and understanding of climate change is there? Would you say on the reservations in the West? Um, I would say there's a wide uh, recognition and awareness that climate change is happening and that the effects are very real uh, within communities throughout the Southwest that we have interviewed. There's a lot of awareness and eager eagerness to to take action on climate change. So one of the most pressing um, impacts that's felt is rises in temperature. And those, it's not just that it's getting warmer, but that those changes in temperature affect uh, the shifting uh, seasons. So different signs that tribes have relied on for, for centuries or if not millennia, when you know certain plants come into, um, they're ready to harvest or when certain animals are migrating. As the temperature uh, regime changes, that affects, you know, the whole suite of factors of what tribes depend on for their subsistence. So that subsistence lifestyle um, is really critical and tribes are understanding that this is something that, um, that they're aware of and that they want to take action on. And can you give me an example of a tribe that's really leading the way in terms of adaptation to climate change? Yeah, I would say the Gila River Indian community uh, here in Arizona is doing you know, really remarkable work on uh, taking a step forward uh, working on, um, you know, understanding the impacts of climate change, working with the University of Arizona to get uh, climate data so that they can really apply that to managing um, their resources uh, and, you know, dealing with water is another key issue. So um, understanding while tri some tribes may have their water rights settled, how are you going to really ma efficiently manage those water resources into the future so that you can really make every count uh, every drop count uh, for um, under circumstances where you may not be able to depend on you know the regular conditions of the water always comes at this time of the year so really um, being able to plan for 
uh, future scenarios in which um, there may be less resources available. That's it for us. Andrea Kelly will be back next week. Thanks for watching.